Kate. Uh, really, really glad to be here with all of you. I am the environmental organizer at Hoosier Action. I work in Southern Indiana, right along the Ohio River, um, across the river from Louisville, Kentucky. And um, I'm gonna kind of get us started with like in some introductions. What is this training about? Um, and I would love if you're able to turn on your video, that would be awesome. I think it helps with Zoom trainings to like have your video on and you know be in the space. Um, but if you can't, that's totally okay. And then, yeah, I'm gonna give a little bit of an introduction of like, what is this training about today? So today's training, we're gonna be really talking about like, why do we need a culture of belonging in all of our organizations and all of the different types of work that we do? And like, what are the core components to create organizations of belonging wherever we are in this country? And we're gonna have time for all of y'all to like reflect and workshop um, what this means for your own work at home. Um, and the other thing I'll say is like, I've been organizing since 2020. I've been to a lot of trainings and this is like this type of training on how do you build a container and grow a container and keep people together is not super common. So we're like really piloting this and like taking a step towards it and would love feedback from all of you um, at the end of this training or afterwards. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it to Kate and Eva to introduce themselves, and then I would love to hear from all of you. Kate? I'm Kate Hespace. I'm the director of Hoosier Action. I use she, her pronouns. I um, started this organization seven and a half years ago after organizing for a few decades in other states and wanted to come back to where my family, where I grew up, my home was to figure out what does it mean to build an organizing project in small and rural uh, Indiana. I'm really happy to be here with you. Um, I'm Eva. Um, I am an organizer with Hoosier Action. I organize moms in Clark County, Indiana um, to improve and protect public education. I've been organizing for about five years, all five years organizing moms, uh, did some work on maternal health and learned some lessons along the way and now doing it um, with my community. So I'm really excited to be here with everyone. Awesome. And like I said, my name is Lakshmi. Um, I have grown up in Indiana. My family immigrated here um, when I was a young kid and went to school here and like found this organization at a time in my life when I really needed it. Um, and now I organize on environment and like bring people together across race, generation, class to like figure out how to make real change locally here. Um, okay, so there's 26 of us here. And I would really like to do like verbal introductions. So we're going to try to go like at pace, keep this brief, but like would love to hear from each of you. Um, and if you could say your name, your location, your role or organization. Um, and I'm going to start it off with Megan. Um, my name is Megan. I'm in Moscow, Idaho. And I run Inland Oasis, which is our local pride organization. And we also do a lot with food insecurity. Uh, we run one of the bigger food pantries in the area and stuff. Awesome. Liz? Um, my name's Liz Hills, and I live in the middle of nowhere, Wyoming. Um, and I don't currently have any, any organization. Glad you're here. Um, Mija, I don't know if I'm saying your name right. Yali Kuali Chanali, my name is Miha, I go by they pronouns. Um, I'm from Spanish Kootenai, Ponderay, and Body Territory, Missoula, Montana. I work with Trans Visible Montana, we're a statewide collective of transgender, non binary, and two spirit Montanans. Um, and we do leadership development and public education. I'm currently on a bus um, somewhere between Spokane and Pasco. So um, I might be in and out of service. Thank you. Glad you're here. Also, your state is beautiful. <laughs> um, Sarah. Uh, you talking to me? Yeah. Hi. Uh, sorry. My name is Sarah Coletti. I prefer Peanut Q Public. I use she, they pronouns. Um, I just moved to Hartsel, Alabama from Huntsville, Alabama. 
which uh, Huntsville is the largest city in Alabama. Hartzell is nowhere near that, but will eventually be eaten up by Huntsville, I imagine. Um, I'm with Huntsville Bail Fund, but I've also recently started a community Alabama page to get the word out about other direct actions going on in the area. Uh, I went to one of these trainings. I missed the last one, but I'm hoping to catch the rest of them, and it's awesome to see y'all here. Great. Glad you're here. Um, Emily. Um, my name is Emily. I use she, her pronouns. I live in Helena, Montana. It's nice to see another Montanan on here. Um, I work for the Northern Plains Resource Council, um, which is a grassroots community organizing group um, based out of Billings, Montana, but I work in our field office um, and I organize in Helena and Great Falls. Cool. Um, Gerardo? Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gerardo. Um, with, I'm calling in from Henderson, Nevada. I use uh, he, him pronouns. Um, and I am with Make the Road Nevada. Um, we are a civic engagement nonprofit uh, organizing in, uh, well, trying to organize in a couple different towns across um, rural Nevada. Um, currently have organizers uh, in Haram, Nevada, and um, hopefully soon in Winnemucca in Northern Nevada. Um, so thank you all uh, for having me and happy to be here. And then Ashley. Hi, uh, Ashley Stahl. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am the executive director for uh, PFLAG of the Roaring Fork Valley. Oh, I'm, I'm in the Roaring Fork Valley, Colorado. So rural Colorado, Lauren Boberts district. Um, I'm the executive director for our local PFLAG chapter and the Roaring Fork director for another nonprofit that focuses on queer and disabled inclusion. Uh, yeah, nice to meet you all. Welcome. Um, Kimberly. Hi, um, I am the outreach coordinator for North Idaho Pride Alliance. I am uh, in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Uh, and sorry, I my pronouns are she, her. And I'm excited, super excited for this training because uh, we were the ones who had the um, Patriot Front try to take over our Pride event um, in 2022. We had, uh, they were all arrested and after that, there was talk. We almost shut down because we just weren't, we didn't know where our um, program was going to go, but it has exploded um, since that event. We've gotten people, we've got more support, we've got, so um, I decided to stay because there was a point where I was going to move out of the area because there's still, it's so uncomfortable here that I have family and friends who don't feel safe here. So they don't come to any of our events. Um, you know, we had the Utah basketball um, that happened here in Coeur d'Alene, just down the street from me. Um, so we still have a lot of haters here, but um, we also have a lot of support. So learning how to continue to keep our uh, program going and building it stronger and just continuing to fight the fight and not let the bullies win. So I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Yeah, really glad you're doing this work. Um, and for folks who are just joining in, we're just doing short intros, um, naming your name, location, and your role or organization, role and organization. And I'm gonna pass it over to Rusty. Hey everyone, uh, Rusty Williams. I use he, him pronouns. I'm calling today from Putnam County, West Virginia, and I am the interim advocacy director at the ACLU of West Virginia. So happy to be here. Alexandria? Hi, um, I go by Allie, she, her. Um, I'm from Morgantown, West Virginia. I'm so excited to see so many people from West Virginia in here. Um, and I work for Project Rainbow at our shelter, the Rainbow House. Cool. And then Ashley Balza. I go by she, her pronouns. I am located in Wichita, Kansas. 
Um, I'm the community organizer for the Wichita metro area for a loud light and we focus on educating and empowering the youth of Kansas through um, voter education, youth voting turnout, coalition building and engagement. <laughs> I'm going to hand it over to Liam. Hey, y'all. Um, is my audio working? Can you hear me? Okay, great. I'm Liam. I use they, them pronouns. I am uh, calling in from northern Wisconsin. I live in a little town called Bayfield. Um, and I'm not involved in any um, official capacity, but I do a lot of informal community organizing, including including organizing around housing accessibility and, and food justice here in um, rural northern Wisconsin. Taylor? Sure. Hi. Did someone say Caitlin or did I mishear that? You can go. Caitlin, go ahead and then take it. Okay. Apologies. <laughs> um, I'm Caitlin. I am also with Northern Plains Resource Council, like Emily. Um, I am calling in from Billings, Montana, and really excited to be here. We do grassroots organizing, um, member led power building organization, work on environmental energy and um, economic justice, ag issues, et cetera. And um, I should say, I will be on and off camera trying to juggle lunch and also saying hi to my six month old. So I'm here and also um, juggling a couple things. Taylor? See you, uh, my name is Taylor. Oh, Taylor, sorry. Uh, I am in Cherokee Nation. Um, I am with Freedom Oklahoma, um, and we are an organiza organization that serves uh, the 39 tribes in Oklahoma, as well as the state of Oklahoma, and focused on lived equity for 2SLGBT. Cool. And then Sarah? Hi, Sarah. Hi, Stephen Smith uh, from Charleston, West Virginia, with an organization called West Virginia can't wait. We're a political machine for people who aren't rich here in West Virginia. Um, Courtney. So on mute. We will go to. Hi. Um, I think I've taken myself um off mute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Courtney Dowell. She, her. I live in Charleston, West Virginia. Um, I volunteer with several different organizations, um, and I'm very happy to see some friendly faces on this call because we volunteer together <laughs> in a few different uh, orgs. I will say that um, I volunteer here and a couple of years ago, the CDC declared that my county uh, had the greatest risk of HIV spread in the entire nation. And I work with a couple of different organizations to try to prevent that. Yeah, I'm very glad you did that work. You need it. Um, okay, I'm gonna hand it to Rija. Rija Khan. Yeah, hello. My name is Rija Khan. I'm from Kansas City, Kansas area. I also work with Loud Light, and we work on, um, as Ashley had mentioned previously, work on mobilizing young folks to partake and basically like civic action. And I am also a community organizer and have. I'm very happy to be here. So thank you for hosting this. Um, okay, is has anyone not gone? Can you just jump in and introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm Gabrielle Gilbert. It comes up as Sebastian, but um, I don't know why with this link it does that. So I'm from um, Clickitack County um, in Washington State. I am a advocate and my community and I address um, local government from city government to county governance. Um, I was successful in my advocacy in getting a state law in education in 2020. I um, address a constitutional sheriff who gets a lot of press 
um, and I have been um, vocal and public in my um, attempts to hold him accountable and not be fearful of him or his posse or his supporters. And that has afforded me a lot of media press. And also um, he's on my speed dial when he trespasses, such as bringing in white supremacist groups into the community or um, he uh, basically threatening to arrest elected officials or county workers um, should he deem what they're doing as unconstitutional. One of the things I advocate for um, extensively is um, childcare in our rural community. We are considered a childcare desert. I attach childcare as an economic infrastructure and I address my uh, elected officials from local to state to federal level to start addressing um, the lack of resources um, that come into rural counties is a real issue. Um, I also will say that I am very much involved in getting my name and getting my commentary in the press. I feel that advocacy and press are um, uniquely linked and um, it allows for more exposure about what you're doing. Our small paper in the Gorge, which is called the Gorge News, has a circulation of 7,000 people. Um, and also you have the opportunity of other um, media sources uh, linking into the story and pushing that. And and I believe strongly in, in getting in the press and, and I do it religiously. So thank you for your time. And this training has been amazing. Thanks for sharing that. Um, that's great. Um, I'm going to keep a, keep moving us forward. So if you haven't gotten to introduce yourself, please do so in the chat. Um, we'd love to hear from you again, like your name, where you're calling in from, and uh, what organization you're at. And it sounds like we've got people from all across the country, from like Western United States to the Appalachian Mountains, like really diverse set of people in this Zoom meeting, which is super exciting because we need organizing in all these places. And like I said, like today's training is really going to be about like, why do we need a culture of belonging in our organizations and what are the core comp components to create that? Um, and before we jump into the why, I want to ask you all, um, and we'd love to hear from like a couple people, like given the world that we're in right now, where are you struggling? Okay. No, you're good. Where are you struggling with building and holding a team? Where do you feel stuck? Does anyone feel compelled to share? Yeah, Alexandria says, my own personal burnout makes me into social. Yeah, that's super real. I feel like since COVID, that has gotten even worse uh, for myself, too. Ashley? Yeah, we have a lot of people who are like, theoretically interested in helping, um, but are also really concerned with like being public and visible and putting themselves out there from a safety perspective. So that's often a challenge for us. Yeah, that's super real. Thank you for sharing that. Others? Um, the rural town I just moved to in Alabama has like no public transportation. It also has very little parking and everybody has to have a car basically to survive. Um, so when you go downtown to the places that you might want to organize or like gather people, there's nowhere for anybody to park and there's no way for them to get there without a car. Yeah, so some like real structural issues, right? Like people not being able to actually get to meetings or get to places. Um, and then I'm seeing in the chat, um, let's see, finding volunteers, keeping volunteers, fears about being public, anti-trans bias, people don't have the time to read, for sure. These are all like real stuff that all of us are grappling with, especially in like a post-COVID world. And like today, we're not gonna solve all of these things, but like, I wish we could, that would be great if we could solve all of the, all of the issues. 
But hopefully this will be like a starting point to like really reflect where are you getting stuck? What's getting in your way? And like what needs to happen to create more of a culture of belonging um, in all the different places that we are. Okay, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Kate. Rebecca, you had your hand up. Did you wanna add anything? Um, yeah, I was actually just going to say in my town, I live in a town called Pahrump. It's about an hour outside of Vegas. And I work with Gerardo with Make the Road Nevada. Um, and here, I think it starts, a lot of our issues stem from, there's not really much of a sense of community out here, especially among um, among people who are not um, kind of rabid Trump supporters. Um, so, you know, like it's the same issues with everybody else, but with our town, a lot of people here, they work from home or they commute out to Vegas and basically Pahrump is just where they sleep. So it starts with trying to foster a sense of actual community. And then you have to kind of build it up from the ground and go from there. I'm still working on that first step. So I'm so glad you brought that in. Cause that's essentially like where this sort of training comes from. So I've been to a gazillion millions tons of organizing trainings from like how do you build relationships how do you run campaigns and when I got to Indiana I quickly realized there was this big missing piece that was like especially as we're looking at a world where people don't join clubs they don't join groups there our institutions are collapsing there isn't um institutions of belonging where we're working and if we just focus on the external work and the external problems and aren't intentional about how are we building a container that can hold, um, we can't win anything. And not only that, we're not meeting people where they're at, which is I'm looking at um, a world where people are increasingly separated, isolated on their own, getting most of their meaning and values from screens that are largely platforms held by multinational corporations and not the people around them. So we've come to realize that if we want to organize and get people in actual formation and live into this deep belief that organized people can beat organized money, we have to be able to hold different kinds of people together and build kind of a culture. It's countercultural as we are like you know, rapidly individualistic and driven apart from each other. We're trying to build these countercultural groups that are actually training us and the people around us of how do we work through conflict? How do we stay together? How do we, I don't even have to, you are not my family. I don't need you to be my friends, but I know you and I both desperately need there to be childcare in our town or to be able to move through the streets safely. And we're going to stay in that alignment. And I, in the organizing world, like so much of it is focused on campaigns and wins. And I want to say like full heartedly, like the, te the testament to your power is if you can hold together through loss, if you can hold your people together through conflict, if your people know that this organization is their home that defends them, protects them, and they become more full human beings in that organization. And that's what we're trying to figure out. So this is a pilot training. I really like if, and and like all of you, I think a lot of you in small towns, like we're really focused on Southern Indiana. We've got our heads down, focused on the people around us. So really want to hear from you, like what's resonant and what is happening where you are and how could we build kind of a, a national orientation to on the ground organizations that are about people in place and bringing people towards their fullest expression of their leadership and desires. So like, I feel like the rest of my life is gonna be pretty precarious and chaotic. And whether that's extreme weather, authoritarianism, this like crazy AI that, and the thing that I need and the thing that the people around me need more than anything is things that are low to the ground that they can walk in the door and actually be with other human beings. And the other thing that we work with our people on is we think this is by design. So like who is benefiting from our, our, from the automation? So like I go to the grocery store, I don't talk to anybody. We're not engaging with our neighbors. Like it feels like it's by design. And, and I'm at, like asking you, like who is winning right now <clears throat> in our kind of separation from each other? Well, that's an that's an easy one. Misery and isolation are profitable as heck. Yeah, because if you can, if a corporation can sell somebody that this item will make them happy, then people are going to go buy it. 
yeah. if this streaming service is going to make them feel less alone, then they're going to subscribe to it. So if people can, like, if a corporation can convince people that they're, you know, better by themselves, then they're going to spend more money on stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else you want to lift up and name? Like, who's winning? Can I just say, in my small rural area, a lot of, and the, and the, the phrase is good old boys uh, tend to be in power. But I do want to say this, part of surviving any kind of advocacy is not disappearing. And every good old boy county commissioner or board of education ultimately is re replaced by someone else. And then there is always that crack in the door in which your advocacy can get through and you can keep moving for another day. And I, I want to say that they, even in a rural community, there are a lot of there are a lot of individuals who make themselves available to their neighbor. I mean, it's kind of a duality. You move to rural spaces to have more alone time or free time or solitary time, but you also have a reality in rural communities where your neighbor is your lifeline in times of need and that exists. So I, I just want to clarify on that point. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's a lot of, there's a lot to draw. I actually like love deeply love a lot of the values in small town and rural areas and the the more um like you're saying like the more obvious truth that we desperately need each other and i think like part of our organizing work is to lean into the best of uh, the best in the culture of where we are um i think the other thing that's winning and i like we're 3 weeks out from it is a billion dollar national election infrastructure that has nothing to do with the local elections, with the people on the ground and what they want, and is largely about lining the pockets of consultants and a, a whole infrastructure that is largely irrelevant to the people in Indiana and their vote doesn't matter that much in the electoral cycle, but the entire, uh, our entire like political conversation is about Washington DC and not about the county you're in, the town you're in, the state you're in, and even giving people the imagination that they could frame and shape and lead inside of that politics. Um, I think I could use the slide. Um, anybody else wanna name anything about like, where are you seeing the separation happening? Where What's happening in your community in terms of people getting pushed apart from each other? Okay. Cool. Next slide. It's not working for some reason. Oh. Your slides finishes. Okay, we're having a slight technical problem. Can you do slides? Uh, yes, I can try to do slides. Let me see okay. if I can do screen share real quick. Cool. I don't know what the what the problem is. Mm -hmm. I guess I'll ask a question while we're waiting, which is like, do you feel like you have a political home and are there political homes where you are organizing? Yes, we can share the slides after. So I can run it as a slideshow because it's on view only. Um, there we go. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. We're just going to run through like some quick definitions of belonging and then get deeper into like what are the components of creating a culture and an organization. Um, do you think you could start on slide three mm -hmm. and move us through? Yeah, we have something in the chat. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say more about this comment, Miha? Miha? Um, pushed apart with woke language, people wanting to hoard, protect property resources, scarcity mentality, low-key jealousy. Is this all things that are pushing people apart? No, on a oh, oh, you're on a bus with people watching. Got it, got it. Okay. I respect that. Thank you for your comment. I just wanted to hear more about it. Um, 
Where I live, we have to cancel a lot during the due to the weather. I've been thinking about having all my events be hybrid events. These trainings make me wonder if we should create a radical rural network so that attendees at all our events could be coming in virtually from all over the country. Absolutely. I think that's what we've been thinking about. And we're constantly trying to figure out what are the barriers to participation. I had a whole meeting with um, one of our chapters, which is like, when do you choose staying home on the couch? And when do you choose coming to the chapter meeting? Because for many people, it's a hard choice to get out of the house and come to a meeting in person. And we had a really good conversation about what needs to be in place for them to show up, which is like food, childcare, transportation, and make and making sure that every meeting is really useful. Everybody has full participation and that it's moving the group forward. Next slide. Okay. So our goal in Hoosier Action is to create a political home. And we have multiple chapters for both ourselves. So this is my political home and our organizers' political home, as well as our members. And we want to build durable homes that are that home itself is as, as critical as the public education campaign, as the affordable housing campaign, that the people inside the organization and how it's functioning is our top priority. And this requires regular intention, building a culture, up, uh, making sure we're upholding the culture with each other and having regular reinvention and not getting static and stuck in the way things used to be, but um, reinventing for what our current membership needs and what the world is asking of us and just holding over and over that the people are more important than the work and that we build a practice and a muscle of being able to work and sit through conflict together. Next slide. So that's for us really starts with belonging. Um, and we're gonna talk more about our framework around that in a little bit, but um, that we're making sure that our members um, feel a deep connection to the organization and know that they're values and their vision are manifested inside of it. It's a fundamental human need that we all have. And I do feel like while there are corporations, corporations profiting off of our pain and loneliness, the best antidote in the world is figuring out how do we get and create and foster deep connections among our people, especially among people who would never be in the room together under any other circumstances. Next slide, please. Um, and then I we use this word political home. This is the best definition that I've had. I truly believe that in order for us to have agency in the world, we cannot be individual agents, but have to commit ourselves to an imperfect, messy political home. And that's a place where we ideate, practice, and build futures that we believe in. We find alignment, we hold each other accountable, and we grow in that alignment through both organizing and education. And it's not a club, it's something that we are actively feeding, growing, and nurturing over time to get ever more power so we can win the things that we need to win and keep our people safe and secure. Um, <laughs> I think with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Eva to talk through like what we've learned in Hoosier Action and where we're going. Do you want slides up for now or you want to take them down for a minute? Uh, I'll take them down and then if okay. you guys want to do slides yeah. so I can see the room. Yeah. I just to full transparency, Zoom rooms are super intimidating because I can't so I have to be able to see everyone and when this there's a screen share and all that I'm like oh my god I can't so um yeah so um <laughs> as before like my name's Eva um I've been organizing for five years and I organized moms um and I had joined Hoosier Action actually as a member um before I became the organizer um but just like kind of give the overall, like we're a grassroots nonpartisan organization. We have members who are a part of all different political parties. We have some Republicans, we have Democrats, we have Libertarians, all united on this like belief that we deserve a better Indiana and aligning them on like the same value. Like we all want thriving futures. Um, we're made up of six chapters that like cover different issues. So we have one that works on re-entry and overdose. We have a chapter that works on the environment, like Lakshmi's chapter. We have um, housing, we have some stuff on medical debt, and then we have public education, as well as a like a think tank made up of members who like really dig into stuff. And as we're like navigating this political landscape. And we understand that if we're gonna build a state that we want, that we actually have to like align different sets of people and like bridge divides across like race, class, geography, like ideologies, if we're actually going to like make impacts on the political landscape. So um, 
I don't know if it's a good time to share slides. No problem. Um, so, Action has been around since 2017 and has gone through a lot of different phases as we've built power. And the biggest one, the most memorable one that we all can point to is when COVID hit, which I'm sure all of us can remember when COVID hit, right? Um, and we had to move online. And when we did that, we were actually doing these like briefing calls on COVID. We were like tracking things as we go. We were just trying to like keep everyone together, like in the boat um, as we were like navigating this chaotic time. And by doing that, like we really expanded the amount of people we organized and the amount of people we reached. And we did everything online. I know we did mom's coffee hours online. We did a lot of things that, to reach a lot of people. And it really did work. It's how we were able to meet the moment. Um, and we had members across the state. But as we like things started to open up and expand, um, the expansion of people didn't necessarily equate to like the power we needed to create real change. And it wasn't the feeding like our communities on the ground, like it wasn't meeting the needs. We weren't able to really meet those moments with them. Um, and we weren't really creating a political home anymore. Um, and it was like thin, the power was thin. It wasn't gonna move things. So we knew from that point that we needed to actually be placed and rooted and in person to be able to build long-term sustainable power. And it's um, how we came up with our theory of change, um, which is like, we wanna be the church where it's like the people where we make deep meaning making, they come in with all walks, through all walks of life, different lenses coming in as their full selves um, to really like make meaning about what's going on in our lives. Um, we have like some examples, like my chapter had a paint a pumpkin last October mm -hmm. and it was a listening session for moms. There was no like moving them to a campaign right away. It was really like, come talk about this experience of being a mom and paint a pumpkin. Um, and then we have like a dedication garden that's happening actually this Saturday with our Care Not Touch chapter to like memorialize people who have been lost um, along the way. So really like me, spaces of meaning making. We wanna be the bomb shelter. So like we wanna be in relationship with those who are doing direct services. And we wanna do know your rights trainings. We have a know your rights training on medical debt. Like how do you fight that? And we have, we've done one on navigating um, special education. So really want to give people the tools to fight back and be like that bomb shelter. And then like Revolutionary Vanguard, we train our people, we develop leaders, we find leaders in the community and move them forward. We meet with local elected and state elected. And like we continue to like move and change the political landscape. That is, and power building is not off the table. So we've been doing this and we've been moving on this theory of change, staying really local, really like investing in the local leadership, really moving this forward. And we've done a whole set of things to like get there. And the way that we knew like as a test, like is this theory of change working was actually two weeks ago. I think it was, oh my gosh, two weeks ago. Sorry, time's not real. Uh, it feels like it was a year ago, but two weeks ago we had a town hall that was across our region that had over 200 people in the room. It was a multi-partisan room that like aligned folks in front of a bipartisan lineup of legislators and making a demand, not just on elections, but really on the legislative session, like who are you gonna show up for? Are you going to show up for us or are you gonna show up for corporations? And we organized that room in front of those electives. So that was a room of people who would not in any other circumstance talk to each other. They were multi-person. They were people coming in with different lenses, different class, different race, like moved together in unison in front of those electives. So that's how we knew at that moment, okay, we've made the right call. And like, we're really moving something forward. Okay. I think you're handing it to Lakshmi now. Yeah, I'm handing it to Lakshmi now. <laughs> okay, cool. And we can keep on the slides. So I'm going to transition us into like, what are the key components that we've learned from doing this work over the past few years for what it means to build belonging uh, and build towards belonging? So some of the things that we're going to like hone in on today are 
having boundaries and definitions. I think this kind of speaks to some of what Caitlin was bringing in in the chat of like the chapter meetings become social outlets and like that encompasses what work you're doing, like having role boundaries and definitions on like what you're doing together. Another that Eva is gonna dive into is like putting relationships over work. And then Kate's gonna talk more about like norms and rituals and navigating crisis and conflict. So um, I'm gonna start off with like boundaries and definitions. Okay, so like all of us here are doing work different places and like you have a purpose right and so make it a slide yeah this is like explicitly defining with your people and not having it be like an abstract thing that you don't actually talk about but like explicitly defining what who we are and what do we do what do we do together and like who are we to each other right and this purpose can like change over time but you're not trying to be all things to all people you have like a clear mission yeah and i think this is also important for like people need to know how to act in space with each other not in like a prescriptive way that it's the only way you can show up and still want people to be authentic and real but like in order to feel like safe and secure they need to build guardrails on like what are the shared agreements when we meet when we come together right how do we operate so like one example uh, on this is for every chapter meeting that we have, we start off with like welcome, open, and community agreements. So we like go through a set of community agreements. Uh, one of the ones that we always have is like productive tension is good. Uh, another one is like step up, step up. We want people who are gonna usually hang back to like take a risk and step in, or people who talk a lot to like step up their listening, right? And when this this kind of stuff is like not made clear and explicit, it kind of reproduces the same dynamics of how people might show up, right? So like people who talk a lot might talk a lot and take up a lot of space. And uh, yeah. So another example, like across our organization of this is we have a set of axioms. So these 12 axioms, were first created when the organization started back in 2017 by a set of members. And um, I think just earlier this year, we like updated them and ratified them with our members at our annual meeting. And I actually wanna take some time to like read through this with you guys. So I'm trying to think of the, but I feel like if we were in person, we'd go around in a circle, but um, since we're not, I'm gonna hand it to like, um, I'll call on people and can folks read like three of them at a time? Does that work? Okay, Megan, can you take the first three? Sure. Uh, so number one, people are the center of our work. Every human deserves to live a life of dignity, opportunity, safety, and freedom. Uh, two, we are a power building organization. Power is organized people plus organized money. And three, relationships are the core of power building. Um, Liz, can you get four through six? Our work is to move people from victim to leader, scarcity to abundance, from isolation to community, and from despair into action. Our work is most powerful when we build unlikely alliances. We embrace the process, productive tension, and agitation. We are not building a club. We bring together, we, can, we bring people together across race, class, culture, and geography to take powerful action in our state. We determine what's possible, no one else. Emily, could you get seven through nine? We are disciplined. We do what we say we'll do, when we say we'll do it. We'll, we show up on time. We hold honest and direct conversations. We walk toward others. We stay at the table. We invite others to join us in taking action around our collective values and self-interest. We don't help people. We work to empower them. A well-functioning organization is necessary to contest for power. Awesome. And then Rebecca, can you get 10 through 12? Our work calls us to choose change over comfort. We are brave in our public life in order to learn, grow, and build power. 
We meet people where they are at with curiosity. We ask hard questions and we have real and serious conversations. Everyone deserves a public life. The public arena is where we protect our communities and build a world for us all to exist. Thank you. Okay, I'm just gonna pause there. So these 12 axioms are like a set of guidelines that are like a through line in all of our chapters. And I'm curious, like, as people were reading those out loud, what stood out to you guys? Like what resonated with you or what didn't? Um, we'd love to hear from a couple people. I really like the we ask hard questions because so many people shy away from that and they're not, they're afraid to have those conversations. And for me, keeping the conversations going, asking those hard questions, and we may not agree on each other's side, but if we don't understand the other side, we can't ever bridge the gap if we don't ask the hard questions. So that is really important for me. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And like so often we aren't taught to do that, right? To walk towards tension and towards hard questions. Anyone else? I um, just, um, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, I just think these are really good and I maybe offline would love to hear more about the process of developing these with your members and your leaders. I mean, these are just, they're so good. There's so much organizing theory woven into all of these. And I think a challenge we find in our work sometimes is um, when we are operating on kind of implicit understandings of what organizing is and what that asks of us. But um, that's not an understanding that we've necessarily built with every single person who walked in, into the door. And um, yeah, I just think this does a really nice job of that in a really simple way. <clears throat> this I so I really I came out of faith based organizing and and there you have so many old sacred texts that you can draw from over and over and then then building an individual membership organization we wanted to have something that we could revisit every single meeting to remind us of who we are and what we do this process um, of doing this with members and we had a long meeting with them and most of them were established members but they really took this on and like wordsmithed a bunch of them and we fought about them and now it's like we can open up a meeting and be like let's actually just talk about number eight like where are we struggling with this where is it showing up also people I like that these create tension like some people have pushback on a set of things and that always opens up a really good conversation about like we actually don't frame about helping people we think that people know best and now we're calling them to their leadership so we can solve the problems and not be charity for them. And you're welcome to steal them. Thank you. Yeah, any other? I love number 12. I think public space is where um, advocacy thrives. And I think uh, the most powerful three minutes are the public comment space in um, local government or state governance. Um, um, and I also believe heavily in um, being a cold call queen and calling up my state representative, calling up my local representatives and giving them my thoughts. So um, the public space one is gorgeous. Yeah. Also love cold call queen. That's amazing. <laughs> we should all be that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to Eva to talk about relationships over work. Yeah. No. So relationships over work. So it's just going off the slide. It's like commit to the people, not the work, as Kate said. Like we get told the story, uh, mostly in the national spaces, like win, 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 scale, 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 get all those people in front of the building. Like we hear an, or an organizing story that maybe is not always linked to reality um, for, for some of us. And then moving up the speed of trust, at the speed of trust as fast as we can and slow within us. Like we're meeting people where we're at, if you're gonna do that and really like have these deeper conversations with them and also have direct conversations with them, you, you have to build trust with them and the room has to build trust with each other. Again, deep relationships over scale. Scale is only as good as the people you've built it with. Scale can often be unsustainable and not, and you might not walk away with much, but maybe a great press hit, but maybe not actual like power that's sustainable. 
And in the act of walking towards each other, again, like humanity is messy. Building relationships with people is messy and we do human facing work and we're experiencing a lot of different things, all coming from the same bad actors, but presenting in different ways. And tension is good and it's a good thing to like walk towards each other in that tension. You need a culture of that, which means you need relationships at the center. And then the direct conversations and then rooting out false urgency. There are going to be a lot of things that get put in front of us that like feel urgent and feel like we have to do it and we've got to run to it. And like, we have to like build suddenly, root it out because it's not going, urgency tips into anxiety. And when you're moving at that pace, you will burn out and you'll burn your relationships. Um, and I have actually like a very like good example of that. So um, when I started organizing moms, um, I was really getting into it and then the pandemic hit. And our first move was like, meet people where they're at, right? So I did the thing that I felt like I needed as a mom, uh, which was like, we held coffee hours. So we did these on Zoom coffee hours with moms to like navigate the pandemic. And that's where it started. Um, but then like, as we went, we started working on maternal health and we started like showing up to legislative session. And I had a statewide chapter for a while um, during that pandemic. And I was had this like idea that moms have a lot of power, which we do. We have an incredible amount of power, but like we should go and fight, fight, fight and build, build, build. And I'm going to get 200 moms to the state house and we're just going to throw down. I had this idea of like a perfect type of organizing plan. Like there's like this perfection that like invades, right? Around like, I'm going to win all the things. I'm going to go, I'm going to win. We're going to fight. We worked on maternal health and then we jumped to expansion of the child tax credit and then we jumped to child care and we jumped to electoral work. And the power I built while I we had some really awesome, amazing things along the way, I learned a lot of hard lessons by staying in that orientation of trying to always hit scale, trying to always just name a win. I want to name a win. We've got to win some things. I lost my bait at the end of it. I was burnt out on organizing and I was also not in relationship with my own role as a mom mm -hmm. in, in the middle of, I was denying the very thing that made me want to organize moms. Those are some really hard lessons to learn. And I built thin power. So when I moved to Clark County, I built the thing that I knew I needed. So same concept with the coffee hour. And I have, there's a lot of pressure on us to win things, whether it's like through funders, through like what we hear our colleagues are doing, like to move fast, build power, win things. So I decided that I was not going to do that. I was going to like go against that pressure and actually take the time and build um, a community of power building moms. And we were going to spend the year building those relationships, bringing, developing those leaders, and also really making meaning of what is the experience of a mom and how does it like, how do we bring it into the public arena? And because I did that and I spent that year actually going deep, building those relationships, we have tension at our chapter meetings. I have tension in direct conversations with leaders. Um, and every time we come out stronger and bigger and that, picture of the town hall, that was only a portion of my chapter. Building those relationships is how you get to the point where you can navigate hard work, like taking on public education, taking on those big things, and like eventually, yes, making the wins, but like really making those like really, really, really like making those like landscape changes that we need to have something sustainable. Yeah. It is worth like being where people are at to move, then to move them into power. So just wanted to bring those examples in. Organizing is magical. <laughs> um, all right, third thing that we really landed on, if you wanna create a culture of belonging, which can, this can feel a little um, counter to people. So a lot of times like come to organizing because we are angry and brokenhearted and want to throw ourselves into being a part of creating a better 
more humane world for ourselves, for the people around us, for the people we love. And so sometimes we can pendulum swing when, when order and structure and institutions have been what has harmed us into wanting to not have any structure. But what that does is actually just recreate the same status quo power dynamics inside of your group because the people that feel entitled to speak and take up space in other rooms will speak and take up space in your room. And so our work is to create the structure and space so that everybody can participate and you can start to adjust for some of the, the uneven power dynamics that exist in the world by facilitating and investing and creating the right space for your group. Now, I don't know what that is. I just feel clear that you and your people need to know what it is. So that means like rituals and regularity. Like this is how we start our meeting. We've all agreed to it. This is how we start. We all know why we're here and what we're trying to do. That the like wh whoever like is leading the room is really aware and cognizant of who's speaking, who's not speaking. Um, and I always stick this thing in, but if you ever want to Google it to train people, the CIA put this manual out in like, I don't know, 1930 something. Um, that was like, how do you infiltrate and disrupt groups? Because they wanted to infiltrate and disorganize probably communists or something. Um, and that list of things is exactly what happens in our meeting, even without the CIA there, which is things like stand up and grandstand argue over small points, go back to points that have already been made, break your group into smaller and smaller groups and make sure that it's bureaucratic. So there are ways in which most of us without organizing don't really know how to have effective and productive time that is actually honoring the people in the room. And we have to be intentional about making sure that we're using our time, that we're ending on time, that we're helping people navigate conflict and we're ensuring that everybody has a real decision-making seat at the table. Um, anything else you guys want to add to that? Okay. And then the, the last thing that will just happen, you can count, like you will hit crises and you will hit conflict. I've come to the point where like, I'm not surprised by it anymore. The thing that gets you through external crises and conflict is having a team. And knowing that, that everybody on that team is in relationship, has done enough work together that they know each other, and they are they are in it both for themselves, but to show up for each other. So much of the time, it's not that our opponents are so strong, it's that we can't we can't hold. Um, <clears throat> so there's a couple of things people do that I really, I would just really encourage you in creating a culture that doesn't reinforce these things. So one is they try to have frictionless, tensionless meetings. They like tamp down conflict. Instead of defining for your people, productive conflict is actually, and us disagreeing is the sweet spot. That's where we get to like real imagination, real power and real agreement. So you want to figure out how you're training your people to disagree with each other. And in fact, when people aren't disagreeing with each other, they're often sitting on disagreements that turn into resentment, that turn into backtalking, that turn into people leaving, and factions. You have probably seen this in your life. So you're trying to figure out how do I and how do we disagree? Um, this, the second thing I see people do is I guarantee if you want a powerful group, whether that's a geography-based group, an identity-based group, if you want a powerful group, you will not like everybody in that group. You won't. You won't want to hang out with all of them. You are not building your team to have to for them to be all your friends. And in this lonely, lonely world, it's actually important to be pretty straightforward and clear about that, that we are together. We have a lot of public love for each other, but our primary purpose is for us to build power for regular ass people in the state of Indiana. So we do our work together and friendships are made and people fall in love and things happen. But the primary purpose of this group is not for us all to like each other. And in fact, we want to be heterogeneous. We want people that are coming in with different perspectives. As long as we can all agree to the axioms, figure out how to disagree to each other and know that like at the end of the day, I'm not going to go have dinner with you, but I'm going to keep coming back to the table because you and I both want childcare. 
The third thing that people do is like real power and real people power is chaotic. It is not to be controlled. And I bet all of you have seen and had experiences with people confusing power with control. So you want to train people into an abundant orientation of power that is not um, that is not about perfection, but really about how do we unleash as many people as possible, which is like really one of the fundamental problems in our country is like people are, un are not unleashed in collectives to go get what they want and demand what they want. They don't feel entitled to get what they want. So how do we unleash people to actually take leadership and make demands in their community? There's probably like a lot more to unpack here. Um, and I feel like there's more lessons internally, but crisis and conflict to me is the most, if you can get through both external and internal crises and conflict, you are on the path to being able to get people elected, win real things, do things. Um, and this will happen regardless of whether you want it to or not. Anything anybody else want to add here? Okay, I saw some nods. Um, all right, so now actually just want to, do I hand it back to you or do I set this up? Um, no, no, no. All right, I'm going to set it up. All right, so these are the four things that, and I bet some of you are doing all of this or some of this really well and actually really want to hear from you about what's working. So I wanted to spend some solo time, just maybe five minutes thinking about in these four categories what is working well and what do you feel like you need to start focusing on in order to be able to hold your team, deepen your team, grow your team? Does that make sense? And then we're going to come back together and workshop a bunch of them. Just nod if that makes sense for the people that have you. All right. So five minutes thinking through this, and then we're going to just kind of popcorn a bunch of people and see what else is working well in these categories, what's missing and um, where you want to grow or where you feel stuck. All right, five minutes.
Okay. Let's come back together. Okay. Should I take the slide down? Yeah. It's... Yeah, then I can see people. All right, we're going to come back together. So if you're able to turn your video back on, please do so. Okay, how was that? How was reflecting on your work? What came up for you guys? Were there things that you felt like really resonant or really working well for you at home? I'd love to hear from Emily or Caitlin, Ashley. Yeah, I guess some of the things that I thought through or that um, resonated was um, like we're really trying to move to uh, move in the direction of like talking to our community, listening to our community, and, and instead of just like creating programs or uh, projects based on our perceive like our perception of what is needed, like actually. Um, really engaging with that community and letting that community tell us what is needed. Um, so that was one thing uh, that I thought about. And then um, I also thought a little bit about the norms and maybe some things we could do better in terms of what, when working with the queer community and also their families and also allies, I think we could do a better job at setting like um, boundaries and rules about like what's each space we use is for because sometimes it's a space for that's meant to support and uplift the queer folks other times it might be a space that's meant to support family members um or you know different aspects of the community and i think it would maybe make people more comfortable participating with like very clear uh expectations in terms of what each space is for now how do you think you would do that um it's so i mean it First and foremost, I think is thinking about like what the purpose of this, you know, the space is and then defining those like wh who is this for and then kind of setting those guidelines. And then I think uh, a big piece of it is oftentimes we don't want to exploit like we just you just need to say it like you need to be explicit about it. Um, it's easy to like have it in mind, but you want to be inclusive so maybe you don't want to say like no actually this is more for this other group of people but I think uh there's you if there's a real value in like saying no this space is for, is for this and this other space is where maybe it would be a better fit for for you right now kind of thing the one thing I didn't say which is kind of not totally it's not what you're saying but I I you know, I, I run an organization, but I can't tell you how easy it is for me to get like zapped back into a 12 year old in the middle school cafeteria trying to find a seat and like, where do I sit and how out of place I feel. And if I walk into a new space and I don't know where I'm supposed to sit or what the purpose is or what we're doing, like I can just live in that, that kind of 12 year old nerdy insecure place and that it is actually like somebody naming, like, this is what we're here and this this is what you can do and here's where you can sit. That allows me to kind of shed that anxious self and and be who I am in the room with people. Um, and I think like the, the further people are out from the status quo, like the, the more it's important to be like, this is what we do and you belong here and here's where you sit. And all of that feels like moving it from implicit to explicit is about creating kind of a culture of security. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think uh, as, as I'm a transgender woman and I think of how often spaces in particular women's spaces don't specifically articulate that they're safe for me. And so it can be, I can be left sitting there like, ah. is this a space where I, where, where it's safe for me to go? Is it not? Is do I even really want to ask that question explicitly? Uh, and so I guess I think like that would be something that would help probably a lot of the people that we serve uh, to just explicitly say, this is what this is for. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just excited. That was great. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, other folks want to hear like what 
was resonating and also like where do you feel stuck or yeah who wants to jump in I mean, so much of this resonated. Emily and I, who are part of the same organization, were chatting back and forth about all of the things that um, just felt reflective of parts of our organization when the presentation was happening. I think, you know, I think one thing we do well is prioritizing people and deep relationships. Um, I think sometimes perhaps I get a cost um, or just maybe, I'm not sure the right language, but I, I do think sometimes maybe we shy away from harder conversations um, for the sake of relationships and, or like it depends who the, who the conversation is with, whether we're willing to go there or not. And I think that's something we need to get better at challenging ourselves on. And we have a little bit of the like rural polite culture in that respect and um, it's funny because, you know, our whole purpose is supposed to be sort of rattling cage, but I think we struggle with that a little bit more internally. And, um, the, the thought about not confusing power with control really landed with me as well. I really appreciated the articulation of building power is, you know, inherently about creating chaos and how easy it is to confuse those things. And um, yeah, um, honestly, I just want to go talk to our member leaders about some of this and some of the ways in which we might be going wrong uh, or not going wrong, but um, some ways in which we have some work to do. And then one that really also resonated was um, the tendency to fracture ourselves into smaller groups and uh, even when that doesn't emerge out of sort of factionalism, we have local chapters all around the state. And I think a lot of them have a, a real tendency to like segment themselves further into like committees and end up working on like five different things. And, um, you know, I think we often have a hard time explaining to folks why, it, you know, there is weakness in that. And already we're a small group and we have a big fight up against us. And, you know, it doesn't really help if we have like five committees, each of five people working on different campaigns. Um, so I'm not sure if that is exactly what the, the point was driving at, but that's where I took it. And it was really helpful to have some additional language for it. I wanted to follow up on this having hard conversations. Um, So I get, I want to ask some questions, but I want to say some stuff too. It it feels really hard to go have hard conversations with people, hard where you're like taking a risk to hold up a mirror and be like the way that you're operating is getting in the way of what you want, or this thing that you're doing is driving people away or whatever the thing is. Um, but if there's not a culture inside your organization that's like reinforcing the fact that we have to have them. And if you're not having them with each other's staff, it feels even harder and even riskier. So I think I'm asking the room, like how do we inside of our teams and organizations make it less risky to have real and honest conversations? And have you seen that? Can I say something to that? Absolutely. I'm actually I'm actually a neurodivergent and therefore I could be that person in the meeting that will drive you crazy. <laughs> so. I also want to say, though, my bluntness, and I am extremely blunt and always have been in my public arenas, has actually propelled a lot of the advocacy that I have today. Mm -hmm. And so in, I think there needs to be a balance with that. But I also think that, you know, the thing about advocacy is it is straight from the gut and heart and it can be interchangeable at the same moment. And, and I think that when you have people showing up, that is an amazing battle that you've already won. And you should be rejoicing in that, however it comes. Because what I find, you know, I have parents who I try to organize 
And what, where the strength of their organization is, is they're on a thread. I, I babysit for my parents. So my advocacy for childcare is through that, that group. And in that thread, they organize. If they hear something the city is trying to do that they don't agree with, they will organize in that thread. Whether that translates into them actually consistently showing up at city meetings is a 50-50 chance. So you take your wins where you get and you encourage the next win. And that's just what I want to say about um, communicating in that way. Or, yeah, you know, sticky, like nothing about the human interaction is ever easy, but nothing about the human interaction is never hard either. So embrace and you're always adapting and you're always uh, developing in the moment. And, and, and that has its grace too. So thanks for that. Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to circle back to the bluntness at the beginning, because I agree with you, but I also like culturally Midwestern. So we have small town Midwestern. Um, so I, I think I just wanted to expand, like, where do you see bluntness is really helping your organizing? And like, what do you think we could learn from that? I think that being blunt and cutting to the chase, it's about cutting to the chase. Yeah. There is so much of that, you know, being careful and do I say this? And is that polite? I'm not, I, you know, when I address, especially when I address childcare, my bluntness is because for 50 years, this country has not done anything to change the trajectory. And the amount of posturing and rhetoric around it is exhausting. I always call those discussions about childcare the noise around childcare. So as soon as I start hearing noise about something that is that is that I'm advocating for, I cut to the chase and I hold and I shut that down because for me nothing moves further if we're just cycling around the same conversations. And I think when people are blunt, you move that needle where you need to start looking as well. And that's how I feel about it. And it also is incredibly freeing. And sometimes my friends will laugh and be like, oh my God, I can't believe she said that, but it needed to be said too. And so that's the, that's the balance of it too. You know, look, it's a, it's a, this is what I say too. Win, lose, or draw, be memorable. And that's how I really feel about advocacy and, and being blunt. Megan, I wanted to pull you in on this. Um, I've noticed a lot of organizations, ego tends to take over. Like, what does that look like? Um, and that's where, and you said, and second part, and that's where having those hard conversations can be dealt difficult. Sure. Where it's kind of along those, um, sorry, I know that the screen has you with Sean Sebastian. I know that's not right, but that's kind of what she was saying. Um, that people spend too much time tiptoeing around trying not to hurt feelings because a lot of organizations, a lot of service organizations have people in charge, quote unquote, in charge that have really big egos and you kind of need big egos to get big things done. But sometimes people are too afraid of upsetting those egos to actually say, hey, what you're doing is actually disruptive to this organization or what you're doing is, you know, could be done differently or even what you're doing is flat out wrong. <laughs> so I feel like there's a lot of people that end up being in the top tier of some organizations that just, they're so focused on their own voice that they can't listen to anybody else. And then anytime somebody says, hey, can we talk about this? Like, well, you're just trying to be, you know, you're just, you just want to shoot everything down and, you know, be contra uh, be a contrarian right wow. and, like, and I don't we have the luxury of like we're building our organization together so and I know some people are staff of organizations and mm. I understand they can't necessarily remove leadership if it's a deep problem but I I do think there's something about baking into the culture that is about like we have a regular agitation table you, if you start operating like a lone ranger that is not that is not the measure of your power and worth inside of the organization. And and then so much of our movement have been about celebrity activists and organizers instead of like, actually, how many people are you developing around you? Mm -hmm. How many leaders do you have around you? Not mm -hmm. you, the superstar, it's us together, which is, right. which is again, pretty countercultural. Yeah. Kimberly. <clears throat> 
I just wanted to throw in there because, you know, um, I have conversations with my boss all the time about how we, there's some things that we have to do different. And so we have to have those conversations. We have those hard conversations, but letting her know that I respect her point of view and letting her know, and, and not just her, when I have other conversations to letting them know that even though this is a hard conversation, it's something that we need to do. It's a conversation that we need to have. Having respect for another person's opinion is so important because a lot of times with those hard conversations, like you were talking about power, when you go to that person, they've got this ego on and they're like, I'm not going to listen to you. And then you start to have that conversation and then it comes, it starts to be about you're belittling them or making them feel not intelligent or that their opinion doesn't matter. So in the beginning, I like to start the conversation and not all the time it happens because when people come up to me and cause I wear a lot of shirts about, you know, different topics and they're like, they'll come up and they'll say, well, why do you believe that? I'm like, well, have you ever met a drag star? Have you ever had to have a, an abortion and just turning it back, turning it around to them, it shuts them right down. And then they walk off and, you know, go to somebody else. But I think having, letting them know in the beginning that I'm not here to belittle you. I'm not here to make you feel stupid, but things need to change. Let's just have respect for each other and have this conversation so we can move forward in this organization. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like another thing that you kind of is that like direct asking and, and choosing regularly, like curiosity over judgment, even, even with the people that are in power, like, why is this the way this is and approaching people as full humans definitely does help to disarm people and move them out of perfectionism and control, which is like yes. our biggest enemies inside of an organization. Yep. And it's not always easy either. I'm not saying it's easy at all because I had to, I had to have a conversation with our board in a direction that things were going and that I, I just didn't think it was in the right way. And I'm like, okay, it took me months to get up the courage and say, I would like to come to this board meeting. This is what I want to address. So it's not easy in any stretch of the imagination, but just having the respect for those other people and having a safe space, having this space that each of us can tell, you know, have that conversation express our opinions but in a safe place and not in a in a belittling or you know because I I've, I've been in those situations where because sometimes it's like I don't know that I'm smart enough to have this conversation and just because that's people have made me feel like you're not smart enough you don't have a degree so why should I value your opinion so for me it, it's just respecting everybody, regardless of their education, their status, whatever it is, just having that respect. Yeah. And training the people around you to feel entitled for that respect. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Alexandra, I wanted to call you in because I just actually wanted to hear more about the restorative justice circles and why is that awesome and how is that helping you build? Hi. Um, so with those, usually it's someone who like is designated to hold the restorative justice circle and they kind of, like, I guess, host it basically. Um, and it's like, you know, set questions that they'll ask you and they really have you try to get to the feelings aspect of it. Like what, what, regardless of the action that's being had right now, like what is the feeling that it's giving you so that everybody can... I, I guess just be as vulnerable as possible and kind of give their their full uh like egoless take on what they're feeling and what's going on um and then from there like if you know why what you're doing has an impact on another person or you know vice versa if they if they understand why it's hurting you um then a lot of the time, these people care about you. Like they're, they're not trying to hurt you. You know what I mean? So if they're able to understand, um, then everybody's going to be nicer to each other. Everybody, you know, like not that anybody's intentionally being mean, but, um, impact versus intent is a big thing. 
Yeah. Yeah. Huge. And it feels like just general, like good cultural practice for people to go through inside of your community. Um, Megan, I just wanted to like, we have one college town in our turf and, you know, left, right, or otherwise like power and class are present everywhere. And there's Mm -hmm. so much kind of implicit rules about who belongs in public space and who gets to speak and who gets to advocate in this very liberal college town that has actually made it hard for us to bring regular ass working class people, Mm -hmm. right? Because it was so dominated by people with PhDs. Um, And I think that's part of why we have to have a team because we can't send, I feel like we're sending our members out to the wolves sometimes and they have to come back to something that has their back and is walking them through the like incredibly brave thing of like sitting in a legislative, you know, hearing with eight white men telling a story of like painful childbirth needs to have the backing of an organization that they feel fully full ownership of in order to be able to do that more and more. Yeah. Yeah, We've got two colleges within like two major state colleges within 10 miles. (laughs) And so there's, there's definitely a really weird classism between the college people and the locals Mm -hmm. and yeah it's it's definitely very strange because you get a lot of investments from the college people that then leave in four years (laughs) and then there's there's the locals that are just like yeah but hold on you started something come back (laughs) yeah yeah for real yeah um yeah i think yeah. If anyone wants to jump in before we like close out with like final thoughts, so um, just things that you're mulling over, I want to give you like a couple seconds to jump in now. And if not, let's go ahead and close out. Um, first of all, to like reiterate what was said at the beginning of this training, this is our first time doing this and would love this specific training and uh, would love feedback from all of you on like what worked well, what did you like really resonate with? um, What do you wanna see more of? So like really want feedback. You can put it in the chat or we can put our emails in the chat if you wanna. And I think we could have a quick discussion. I, I would love to hear like, do people want more stories and anecdotes? Do you want more practical tools? Does this feel useful? I feel like we don't have enough conversations about what does it mean to hold people together in, the, in 2024 where people have such limited experiences. Maybe they go to church, maybe they don't like. And so we're, I would love to hear like, what would, what would make this more real for you? Is it uh, more tools? Kimberly said, that's awesome. Yeah. Like, like the axioms or like frameworks for thinking. I think more stories and anecdotes would be fantastic. I think the concepts were really helpful and also, you know, this is hard stuff. So of, of course I'm still left, I think, grasping for some of the places we're coming up short in our organization, you know, sort of the how of actually doing that. And this sounds really boring and infrastructure-y, but like process points, you know, like the axioms I hear as like a process mechanism to have the conversation that you needed to have. So that kind of stuff would be great, but really liked this. That's really good feedback. It's, and people are coming from some, like some of you are, organizing on the ground with no no organization and then some of you are in really big organizations so it's hard to figure out what's what's relevant for people um but i think more stories and more like specific tools feel really useful i well i I used to do a training called how to deal with different kinds of difficult people and actually like making the case that lots of times difficult people are our best leaders but like how do we navigate them in the room and i wonder if that could be layered onto this a little bit too so we're not like we have to manage our own reactive egos when we're leading and how do we actually get a little bit more um, masterful of that. Follow up for, oh, happy. Yeah, would love to talk more, Kaylin. I think any of us would. Okay, other feedback, questions, things that didn't land or anything that resonated or stuff that would be useful for you as you're building out your own work. 
I, I wanted to say quickly on the legislative front, I, when I spoke, when I got my law, I spoke in front of a state representative house of education and I spoke in front of the Senate. One of the things like I'm coming in as just a mom defending my territory in a school district to protect my son. And when I stood in front of these 17 legislators uh, in the house for on the education committee, the first thing out of my mouth, which directed them to the job and tasks that I was seeking more than my story of what I would tell them. But I asked for a unanimous vote coming out of this committee. And I explained to these legislators that each and every one of them had a child like my son in their district and a parent like me in their district. And to serve that, they would come out with a yes vote. And that strategy worked. And then I was able to tell my story accordingly, but it was clear in that first sentence what the task was at hand for them. And that made all the difference. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Ashley, do you wanna jump in and say anything more about your comment? Ashley Blossom. Oh, conflict exposure. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, I just, I know for myself, it is hard to sit in those moments of tension mm -hmm. when you're having an agreement with someone. So how to hold on to your own ego, to your own identity, to your own emotions that can oftentimes be so big so that you know how to have a conversation that is productive and also both parties feel like there's enough space for them because I know that emotions can take up a lot of space which is in incredible and great and we should make that space for them but in those moments of like talking with volunteers or people that are disagreeing um, how can we be better leaders in that and also how do we teach that mm -hmm. I have a dream and I think this would be better on person in zoom, but to really get into some of that somatic work, because I can feel in my body and you can too, when I am overwhelmed or flooded with emotions. And then I've had to develop a set of strategies to like get both feet on the floor and breathe and all of that. And I feel like we should do that in person sometime because so much of it for me is about like, and and we thought about doing somatic with our members too before they go and testify before they like so that you're you're able to carry and hold your own strength as you're walking through and and not losing kind of getting totally flooded that you can't find your way through it which is a really shitty experience when it happens i think that would be a really good addition hopefully sean will save all the comments from this so we can have them i can do that yeah okay you want to lead evaluation and get us out of here? Cool. Yeah. Um, all right. So we spent just over over an hour and a half um, kind of starting this training on like, how do we build towards belonging in our organizations, in our work? Um, I would love to hear from everyone, uh, one word or one sentence on like how you're feeling about this training. Um, we say like, Oh my God, I can't remember the thing that we say about evaluation now. It's worth doing. It's worth evaluating. It's just, anything worth doing is worth evaluating. <laughs> so we're just going to go around and um, yeah, you can say a word or a sentence. And I'll start with um, Ashley Stahl. Um, I guess I'll go with engaged. Emily? Um, this training made me thoughtful for ways that I could bring this back to my own work with the, I guess, like vantage point of my specific members and people and like how to translate the big ideas that we're learning into the on the ground work. Megan? Uh, honestly, hopeful because it's it's trainings like this that that help me remember that there's actually a lot of people that do actually want to work together and not. It, sometimes it's 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 easy to forget, especially when the loudest voices are the worst ones. So, Kimberly, um, I'm gonna go um, piggyback off of Megan and say hopeful and excited. This has been a great um, training and I'm excited about 
connecting with some of the people on here because like Megan said, you know, we're all in this together. And sometimes we lose sight of that when the only thing we hear is the negative. So yeah. Liz. Um, it's, but I think it's been great. It's given me a lot of ideas about how to move forward. And Rebecca. I would say it's um, helped me feel kind of seen because, you know, in, in doing this stuff, it's there's a lot of times where like what you say and what you're doing just kind of doesn't feel like it's making much of a difference um, or going very far. But um, hearing some of the things that I've been doing repeated here um, from other mem from other people in the room has helped a lot. So thanks. Mm -hmm. Gerardo? Yeah, I think uh, this training has been very grounding, um, just kind of giving a lot of uh, useful information that I think I'm excited to, to take back into the community and, and you know, offer as, as opportunities to learn for potential organizers and other leaders in the community. So yeah, really exciting stuff. Um, Caitlin. Caitlin might be able to find you. Really energizing. Thank you all so much. Alexandria. I feel more confident in myself as an organizer after these. I'm realizing that I know more and have ex more experience than I thought that I did. <laughs> so thanks. Um, Ashley. What are Ashley? Um, I feel reflective and also hungry to learn more. Maria? I would say grateful and hopeful because today, I earlier today, before this training, I definitely experienced a negative conflict situation in my organizing group. Um, so this came at a very good time. Um, oh, here, Gabrielle. Mm -hmm. Gabrielle says, Feels this training gave me the tools to walk into a meeting today. That's great. Heck yeah. Hope it goes well. Sean? Sean? Yeah, I feel um, uh, challenged and agitated. I feel like there's a lot to learn and a lot to do. And like not all of it is easy. Um, but I'm, it was very um, inspired. Like I, I feel like I can't hear it without acting on it. And then Cheyenne. And is there, while well, we're waiting for Cheyenne to unmute, maybe, is there anyone else that hasn't gone? I'll go to Kate and Eva. How are you guys feeling? Uh, I felt really good. I wish we could do this in person. Yeah, I think I feel similarly. It's good to get the feedback. Happy to take more. I I feel really committed to to continuing to work on this and figure out like how do we really um make our field more equipped to not just run campaigns, but also like really hold and um keep people together for the long haul because that's what we need. And I I really appreciate all of your thoughts, hearts, and brains. Um, if you haven't evaluated yet. Okay, Cheyenne is looking forward to learning more. Awesome. Cool. And I'm feeling like really energized and more grounded. Um, and I'll just leave us with this. Like it's, I feel so grateful to be a part of all of you doing, all of us doing all this amazing work like across the country. And like, I just want to lift up some something someone said earlier of like, sometimes it feels really lonely and like we're the only ones doing this in this small town or wherever we are. And it's really powerful to see that like we're doing organizing all in all the places and these are the people to do it. So glad to be in this fight with you all. And um, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Awesome. Awesome. This is really inspiring to meet all of you. Please reach out if you have questions or thoughts and have a really good day. I hope the fall is treating you well.
Thank you all. This was great. Have a good night and a great weekend. Thanks, everyone. And thank you to the Hoosier Action team for an amazing training. Thanks for hosting this, Sean. Do you want to, people wanted the slides. Do you want them me to, I'll just share you on them or maybe I'll clean them up and anyway, I'll email them to you.